Good to see you. Thank you so much for coming. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. All right. This way, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, thank you to everyone in this room for your attendance today. I must say I am uh, both Nick and myself and the entire Concordia Leadership Council and our team are humbled by your presence today. It, uh, it is an honor for me to welcome you all to the third annual Concordia Summit. This year represents tremendous growth for Concordia and our summit's theme, building a prosperous future and investing in our youth is an issue that is near and dear to both my heart as well as Nick's. I'm very pleased to welcome President Mikhail Saakashvili of the Republic of Georgia. Along with being an incredible friend and partner to Concordia, President Saakashvili represents freedom around the globe and is an incredible advocate for his country, as those of you who heard his speech yesterday at the UN will know. President Saakashvili is a defender of freedom, a scholar, an advocate of human rights, he's a poet, he's a historian, and most importantly, he is a man of his word. A strong ally of the United States, his leadership of Georgia has brought immense prosperity to his country and the people of Georgia are better off for it. As he pointed out at the UN, Georgia has gone from a failed state to a market democracy within 10 years. As Nick and I set forth to develop a nonprofit that I think we can all say is not lacking in ambition, President Saakashvili was one of the very first to engage and support two young and bright-eyed entrepreneurs. While attending our first summit, the President took time out of his extremely busy schedule to come all the way from the UN to give opening remarks. It says something about a man who has achieved so much in his life that he would entrust two 23-year-olds who decided to host an event on the same day as the UN General Assembly and the Clinton Global Initiative. We had ambition, but we had no experience in diplomatic protocol and had no idea what we were doing hosting the former President of the United States. President Saakashvili's understanding and support made that day much easier for me and Nick. I speak candidly for us both when I say President Saakashvili's engagement in our venture was a risk with little or no personal upside for him. Rather, I think he saw the potential to make a difference, and that was enough. It is his trust, and that of others like him, that has helped Concordia grow so successfully. Mr. President, we humbly thank you for your support, your encouragement, and your membership. Mentorship. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of Georgia. Thank you, Matthew and Nick and Christopher for and thank you for you know introducing me to this amazing group of people. Um, you know, it's my second time at Concordia Summit, and actually every time I'm struck by the magnitude of intellect and uh, the quality of people that come here. I've been certainly I've been at many events, and uh, sometimes it's kind of like you a never-ending story of going from one event to another, especially during the General Assembly. Uh, this is time in New York when I, I used to look at it as a New Yorker when I worked uh, and started to work here at the law firm. And of course, this is the most hated time for New Yorkers when we come to the city. But actually, for me as a president, this is the nicest time to come because I can move around uh, much faster. Uh, so we can certainly have a big class contradiction between you and me, but that's the only one I do. Uh, otherwise, it's really a great thrill. And I remember last the uh, year we were there when, when the young press was admitted because it was the first time when G.W. Bush showed up somewhere, but he was still reluctant to show his face to the press. It was very nice and a very intimate event as well. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, this is really a very uh, important group of uh, people who organize it. Uh, and uh, I was very thrilled, by the way, the other day I was talking uh, to George Lopetakis, who told me that he tried to organize his company according to the principles of Georgian government. I've never heard anybody organizing his company according to the government. <laughs> that's, but that's basically the biggest compliment I could have ever received, actually. I was trying to organize our government as a company all the time. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that's how it works, because otherwise, because instinctively, like for me, government 
doesn't, is not something very good. Because what, what government is all about, it's all about, first of all, regulations. It's all about the self uh, confident and basically uh, for people full of the bureaucrats, full of themselves that want to look important. And government provides lots of abuse for these kind of people who want to satisfy their own uh, you know, ego. And that's, that's the biggest uh, danger of any government. Actually, we started really with, I was the youngest president in the world uh, when we started uh, this adventure 10 years ago. And then I was the oldest for my team. Uh, so we had, uh, uh, I was 35 and we had people, uh, ministers and uh, MPs that were 23, 24, 27. Um, and they were the ones who basically had no taboos. Uh, they didn't look at themselves like government officials. Uh, and you know, the other day I was uh, I was in a street uh, cafe in Tbilisi, and a young lady approached me. She said, "You know, I'm uh, I'm CEO of the main uh, insurance company we have in Georgia, the biggest one." And she said, "You know, I became uh, deputy CEO when I was uh, uh, 23, uh, and so I advanced very fast. And she's I think 28 or 29 now. But she said that's how everybody was in Georgia back then. So you know, when you are a new country." Then you recruit these young people because older ones have experience, but experience is their liability, not an asset in the, the, our kind of bad experience. So she said, when you are 23, and when you become senior figure, and she said, my friends became ministers, deputy ministers, and um, you know, um, members of parliament, you also have, you are all have open mind, you do crazy things, you are radical, you, do, you can really do, do things. She said, on the other hand, and she said, the only thing that only we could do things. That's the problem. In our system, only we were uh, capable of changing things because things seem so hopeless. Uh, and on the other hand, she said, of course, that alienates lots of people, that alienates older generations, that alienates, um, you know, that, 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 that alienates general society. Because if you're 24, 24 year old, even if you're a minister, you have your own uh, age habits. You know, you go drinking at nights, you go dance, uh, then cameras they capture you somewhere dancing, uh, then it's a big scandal for the rest of your uh, career, uh, then, then you, you do things, right? But you know, that was the only thing to do. And actually, uh, this kind of uh, you know, hip-hop government kind of thing uh, was, was something that enabled us to cut 90% of regulations enabled us to move and for small countries benchmarks matter to bring Georgia to, from being 137 in terms of doing business environment although according to the World Bank Index to being number nine. First time ever that a developing country made it to the first ten. It's headed by Singapore, the US is number five on that list, but say Germany I think it was seventeen or eighteen. Um, it um, you know, we we became world's number one reformer based on ten years data according to the World Bank. Uh, we became, according to IFC, we had world's fastest customs procedure, world's fastest company registration, world's fastest property transaction registration, world's fastest ID issuance. Here is Sikir Gyoshate, who was very young, uh, uh, who actually started this uh, Houses of Justice, which is kind of what public service halls were. You get all the services from one window, and you, can, you know, to get a passport, it takes five minutes. Or what we did say on cu at customs, you know, at customs, I remember I had uh, 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 Prime Minister Turkey visiting me, and I told him, you know, I'll take you to customs terminal because there are long lines on the search set, and I saw a show, I'll show you how we did it. And there, the Turkish truck drivers go, and every truck takes a few minutes just to clear customs. And I said, and if it's more than one hour for some reason, then uh, the whole stuff gets fired. Um, and he told me, but uh, he, he was very skeptical about the story. I told him that he said, where do you find such customs officials, that officers that would serve on such conditions, like to work all the time like this? I said, come, I'll show you. And we go there, and I look at them, and I said, these people, we, I told you, and they were young girls and guys, and I said, look at them. They are just newly recruited from model agencies. We just had fired all the customs officers from all these terminals. And these people, the main thing is that they don't have discretion. They are there to smile and to greet you and to say a few nice words, but otherwise it's all done by computer programs. There's special software and it's all done by cameras. And the things and that doesn't leave any discretion to bureaucracy to torture you because that's what bureaucrats are all about if they have any discretion. Uh, so, so, and that's why what the Georgian economy has grown for 
90 years old, I mean, says most of the times so double digit. And this is the country that came under full blown energy embargo. When I became president, we imported 90% of our electricity and gas, 100% of gas from Russia. We came one day under full energy embargo. We lost one day Russian market, which was amounted for 70% for of all export market for our products. Um, we uh, certainly came under numerous provocations. In 2008, Russia invaded us with 100,000 uh, strong army, the same army, the same number of people with which they invaded Afghanistan uh, in the end of the 70s. And Georgia survived all of this. We survived embargoes and we developed and we grew and we uh, attracted FDI. And you look, you know, we came, this was a country that came under 200 Russian planes bombing it. And we have, uh, when I became president, we had 100,000 tourists. And four years after that bombing, we are getting this year almost I mean, five and a half million, maybe six million. And we'll go all the way to 20 million. It showed that we also exhibited stability. We have the lowest crime rate in Europe, where we uh, had a recent change of government. Now there are some little complications, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but in any case, uh, that's, that's the success story. And of course, as always, as a success story, I just read a new book by Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, Lee Kuan Yew had three books. Uh, the biggest one is From World World to First World. And there he is all about you know, how great they were and how brilliant and how everything was perfect. And in fact, they were really successful. I admire them. Uh, but the third book is much more often, and sometimes cynical. And, uh, and then Lee Kuan Yew writes that you know, one thing that catch, caught my you know, attention, he says, Every, in every, success, every successful government, every, every people with steady success at successful government, with steady growth, gets fed up with their government after usually up to nine or ten years. So in any free elections, they will vote out such government, free and fair elections, he said. Because he said they will just vote just for the sake of seeing change. Well, in Georgia, we decided to have free and fair elections because Georgia the experience was all about democracy, all about freedom, all about all the achievements we had was about private initiative and private public partnership. Most of the projects we did was private public partnership with private sector taking lead and public sector being there to facilitate things. So we had free and fair elections and the government and people decided exactly the way the economy predicted. They opted for change. Um, and. Uh, uh, and so, and I recently met a big group of students, also somewhere in, uh, we were at uh, some uh, uh, club in Tbilisi, and they told me, yeah, we voted against you because we wanted to see change. Now what we're seeing, we don't like it at all. Uh, I mean, that's how it happens in Mops. But the good thing is that that's how people learn. The good thing is that we created such strong institutions that with the government that came with a very clear program of undermining them and approving them, they kind of cannot do anything about them. They still continue to function in their automatic manner. Still, still people have seen how democratic success looks. They have taste how it does it look to be in a society without corruption, how to be in a society that is safe in the streets, how to be in a society where the streets are clean and you know, lights are everywhere, uh, how are a society with high growth. And when you get taste of it, then you ask for net government and for miracles. So, and of course, nobody can deliver them, but at least Nobody will tolerate going back. And that's what we created. Because in our post-Soviet world, there were only two models. One model was, in times of Russia, you know, Yeltsin, chaos, street killings, uh, mass impoverishment of people, oligarchs grabbing all the fortune through back doors of the Kremlin, uh, rather than based on meritoc you know, meritocracy and uh, their like, you know, transparent business uh, transactions. Or you had Putin coming in and said, okay, I'll establish order. I will chase out the old, all the oligarchs and I'll be the only oligarch. Uh, I'll chase out all the you know, criminal mafia bosses, I'll be the main mafia boss. And at least there will be some predictability and order. You will know where, where to go for something, right? And then we created something else. And that's what Georgia Power was, so far was all about in all four of Eastern Europe. I just met uh, the Albanian new prime minister. You know, a very capable guy, he told us, you are role models for us, you've always been. We admire you. He asked for George Washington uh, and others, uh, other our young reformers to go there and, uh, and, and teach them how to do things. And it's, it's all over the Soviet sphere, including Russia itself. So we create something else that people can have democracy, freedom of speech, but at the same time keep it street safe, be efficient, uh, and be performing in normal society. 
So that's doable everywhere. That's, the, uh, that's more or less our experience. You know, I'm very thrilled to be here. And uh, whatever questions you might have, I'm here. <laughs> Congratulations.